This video is sponsored by Schoolism. Schoolism is one of the top online art schools taught by industry professionals like digital painter Craig Mullins, legendary artist and illustrator Ian McKegg, visual storyteller Victor Kalvachev, Oscar nominees Dice Tsutsumi and Robert Kondo and many others. When you choose Schoolism for your art education, you will learn to paint, draw and design from the comfort of your home for a fraction of the cost of traditional art schools. A Schoolism subscription will give you immediate access to their entire library of courses, including the ability to watch video feedback and download assignments. With over 50 courses to learn from, choosing Schoolism is a no-brainer for any artist interested in a career in games, movies, illustration, and animation. Use code ARTPROF10 for 10% off your Schoolism subscription today. Hello, everybody. Today, we are going to be doing part one of our self-taught artist curriculum focusing on painting. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at ArtProf, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. I was thinking we should start at the very beginning, Lauren, <laughs> with cave paintings because painting's been around for a while. And I think the way we're gonna approach the curriculum because just so much to talk about with painting, we're just gonna tell you what's out there in terms of different types of paint just to get started because it is overwhelming, this gigantic topic of painting. Yeah, guys, when we were just talking prior to the stream, we were going over all the slides and we couldn't believe how many different types of painting there are out there. I mean, this we're starting with cave painting that's taking actual clay and minerals and putting it on the wall. That is one medium way of using pigments. But there are so many others 20, 30,000 years later that we're going to explain to you today. I'm really excited about it. Because I think a lot of a curriculum is just knowing what's available. And I'll tell you, Lauren, before I went to art school, I feel like I only knew about 5% of what existed. Like I'd never heard of encaustic or casein or flash acrylic. So we're gonna try to show you a tour of what's available in terms of the types of paint. So let's start with your area of expertise. Lauren, how would you sum up acrylic paint? What are some of the features that make it distinctive as a type of paint? Acrylic paint is basically a, a, a pigments that are bound with plastic. They have a plasticky binder. And what it's, it's, they're really easy to use. They're very accessible. They're one of the first paints, I think, that young artists first get into because they dry really quickly. You can buy them fairly cheap and they are mostly non-toxic at the student grade level. But they're also, as, as acrylic has developed over time, it's a fairly new type of painting compared to, say, oil painting or tempera, egg tempera. Acrylic has gotten very, very fancy. You can use golden paints, which have a very lovely body to them. You can, they, they've almost, they're, they're seen as like under oil painting still. Oil really has that, that, five-star approval, but you can get them up to that level of oil painting. They are seen as a serious form of painting these days. And I think the accessibility of acrylic is huge because not everybody has the budget to buy oil paints, which in general do tend to be a lot pricier. You don't have to worry for the most part about toxic solvents. And so there's something about acrylic that I think is really great. Now that said though, I do think like you said, there is this hierarchy with paint that is very frustrating, but that's why we wanna show you a really broad range for each type of paint because I think for a lot of people, they think about paint as, oh, that's for high school students. Sorry if you're a high school student, <laughs> but people associate it with secondary school and just not as, taken seriously the way oil is but Wait, I mean no hierarchy <laughs> but I mean look at these incredible artists we're looking here at Alma Thomas who is an abstract painter 
And I love her, Lauren, because you know what? She was a public school art teacher before she became a painter. And I love that so much. And now her works are at the MoMA, Museum of Modern Art. Yeah, so clearly these types of, of paints, it doesn't, just because you use acrylic paint doesn't mean that you are a amateur painter. There are plenty of these types of paintings that exist in the world that are extremely popular, that are seen in museums. You can do, there's so much versatility with acrylic too. You can make it feel more like watercolor. You can make it feel more like oil. You can <laughs> spray it out of a can. You can do tons of things with it. So yeah, you can do a lot. Kui Kui says, I started with acrylic. Oil was too intimidating. See, that's great. That acrylic was your entry point into paint. And I have to say, there's a lot that I did not know about acrylic paint that I thought I knew. <laughs> like, I was like, oh, acrylic, I've done that before. But then I shot this tutorial with Alex Rowe, and he had all these really smart tricks. He introduced me to slow dry medium and matte medium. And after I shot this tutorial with him, I was like, oh, man, I'm sorry, acrylic. You and I, I just misunderstood you. And... It's got so much more potential than I think people give it credit for. Definitely. I would 100% agree with you. I'd say don't knock it until you try it. Let's talk about flash acrylic, which is a less well-known type of acrylic paint. And this is actually the first time I heard about it was my former RISD professor, Andrew Raftery, was doing all these flash acrylic paintings as preparation for his engravings. I'd never, this was like a couple of years ago. Like I'd never heard of flash acrylic. Tell me in the chat who here has heard of flash acrylics and where did you see it? Have you seen flash acrylic around Lauren? Yeah, flash, I've, I've used a little bit of flash and it's kind of strange because I think flash is the brand but it is also a thing unto itself. It is a, a vinyl paint, I believe. So it's super, super, super matte. It, it catches all of the light and hides it inside. And I feel like it's kind of like using gouache with watercolor. How when you use gouache with watercolor, you use gouache to give it a kick. Similarly, when you're using flash with acrylic, the flash gives it a super matte kick in areas. You're using it for that texture and reflectivity or lack of reflectivity a lot of the time. It's also very yeah. buttery. I mean, my understanding of flash when I saw Andrew's paintings in person is it is a very flat paint. It's opaque and it's water soluble. I've never actually used it. And I do feel, Lauren, that a lot of paint is about like the feel. Yes. Does that make any totally. sense? It's, like, it's how does it feel in my brush? Yeah, my my reasoning for not using as much flash as I think I would like to. If you're an acrylic painter, flash is seen as something that's very sexy, which is a little weird. Talk about that hierarchy there. But it, it is slightly too drippy for me. So I've been trying to figure out where best to use it. I tend to like to really get a large hunk of it on and move it about, but it's just some experimentation, I think. Ewan is asking, does flash acrylic function like Vanta Black? This is for you and you should explain what Vanta Black is first. So I'm not sure because I've never used v Vanta Black. Vanta Black, I does catch a lot of, okay, I'll just explain what Vanta Black is. Vanta Black is one of the blackest black paints in the world. It's made out of nano carbons or something like that. I don't remember the exact thing. <laughs> but basically, oh, and only Anish Kapoor can use it. That's the other part of this. It's And it's mostly supposed to be used for science technology and for reflectivity or catching light in space on satellites. But painters have gotten really interested in it. And Vanta Black is interesting because it catches so much light that it confuses your eye and just makes a big void, a big hole, and your eye gets very confused. It doesn't understand it. So flash paint, that also catches light and absorbs it, but it's not nearly as, uh, cat or, ah, it doesn't catch nearly as much light as that Vanta Black does. 
Jazz W is asking, is it designer grade or is it permanent? And W315 says, does Flash have a mega solvent phenolic chemical smell? I don't have any of these technical answers, you guys, because I don't know anything about Flash. But definitely you can look it up. I'm sure that there are sites. I, I, can, say, these I, I can say it doesn't have a smell. I do know that. I don't really know about designer grade versus permanent. It has... You can look on the back and see light fastness ratings just as you can with acrylic or oil paint if that's something that matters to you. And it is water soluble, so it's going to have so some of the same issues, preservation issues as acrylic, I think. All right, let's talk a little bit about oil and acrylic because as much as there are several similarities like for example glass palettes you can use that for oil and acrylic it's totally fine and there's right. also a lot of crossover in terms of painting surfaces you can have a just sewed canvas you can use it for acrylic you can use it for oil but there's also a lot of really big differences and so this is something we get asked about a lot is what are the differences between oil and acrylic and we have a whole video that explains it, but in a nutshell, how would you explain the difference, Lauren? Between oil and, ac and acrylic on surfaces? Just in general, what are the main differences to be aware of? Oh, well, the biggest one I think is that oil paint takes a really, 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 really long time to dry. An acrylic can dry in 15 minutes. Now on either end of the spectrum, if you're using oils, you can use mediums that will make it dry quicker. And if you're using acrylics, you can use mediums that make it dry slower. But overall, there's a vast difference in the amount of time that you're spending with a piece from it being in its gooey baby stage to it being ready to show on a wall. There is difference in luminescence generally with oil. It's made literally out of lipids, fats, it's fatty. So it has a glisteny luminosity to it that's really wonderful. It feels meaty, it feels substantial. People really like this, they're very attracted to this. Acrylic tends to be a little bit dull and plasticky. And again, you can switch up what you're painting, what your paints look like based on the mediums you add to it. But these are the general differences between the two. Maya Hika is asking, is there a Google Doc of this curriculum? There is not right now, but we are definitely working on it because we do have a Google Doc that goes with each of the self-taught artists curriculum. So we will keep working on that. All right, let's talk about oil. Oil is just always the king of the realm. And it's kind of annoying, but I'm sorry. I sort of agree. <laughs> I know I'm one of those terrible oil yeah, people. I know, I know I'm not helping the whole hierarchy thing, but I, I just love oil. It's, just, it's Nothing beats it, in my opinion. I'm sorry, Lord. <laughs> my, my hot take is that oil is the... the um, weapon of the of the western the westernized art curriculum that gets passed everywhere i always think of oil and like the old masters you know so <laughs> it's, got, well, it's got baggage <laughs> when you've been around for multiple centuries it, it's a hard for acrylic to compete because there's this whole legacy of it's oil it, it my my issue is not oil pitted against acrylic it's oil that's the king of everything else no i mean that's true if you think about printmaking printmaking's always seen below oil painting and watercolor and all that type of stuff so it is unfair but i think what we want to show you is that despite that legacy <laughs> of centuries <laughs> of painting there's a lot more to oil painting than the old masters, like Agnes yeah. Martin. Can you tell us a little bit about her work? No, you should. <laughs> <laughs> Why me? There are too many Agnes Martin lovers out there in the world. I cannot do her work justice. I, I would not be the person to explain her work. I mean, I'm not going to explain her work that well. I just think that she's not 
what most people think about when they think of oil painting. They think more about a Renaissance painter whose name I cannot pronounce, but I love her work. <laughs> and right. so what we really just want to show all of you is oh, that just because it's oil, it doesn't mean it has to look a certain way. Yeah, yeah. The abstract expressionists, they used oil most of the time, and a lot of the minimalists did too. Um, the, these are two mediums of mid, mid 20th century abstract expressionism, think Rothko, color fields, having these big grand pieces with lots of straight up color on them. This is also done with oil painting. So you can get super expressive with oil painting. You can also get extremely detailed and representational with it. The range is really extraordinary with oils. I mean, I struggled with it for a long time. I was convinced in art school, Lauren, that I was an oil painter through and through. I have not painted for so long. The only time I've picked up a brush is for art craft. <laughs> like I have not made like a bona fide oil painting for so long. And I think because it's just a very complex material. And like you said, it has baggage. And that's very different than other media. Yeah, so I think you guys in the chat, when you are choosing a medium to work with in painting, do you think about that? Do you think about how your medium that you're using has been used in the past or what it is generally used for? Uh, what, what is your favorite painting medium? These are two questions that I would ask that I think are related. AJ says, I love oil too. I want to love acrylics because of the lower toxicity, but I love oil paints, luminosity and butter feel. There's just something about the way it just spreads out of your brush. There's just oh, nothing like it. I mean, I was just head over heels. It was like a love at first sight, Lord. <laughs> it, it is very, it does have a very sexy quality to it. It is very fun and tactile to use. I think the flip side of that and thinking about using oil is your setup. How are you using this? Are you in a studio? What clothes are you wearing? Do you have ventilation? Oftentimes when I'm using oil paint, I did start as an oil painter before moving to acrylic. I did oil for um, several years. And I just got paints all over every single bit of clothes that I had, even if they weren't clothes from the studio, because that paint never dries. Also, you are dealing with a lot of smells, not just from solvents. I use Gamsol. That doesn't really have a smell at all. But the paints themselves have quite a heavy smell. So are you sensitive to smells? Do you think you can get used to that? Do you have disposal for your rags, which also have tons of paint on them? other things to think about in whether you want to use oil or not. All right, let's talk about oil bars. And some of you may have seen this stream that Lauren and I did on peacocks and oil pastels and oil bars. And it's basically oil paint in a stick. I feel like I'm talking about a popsicle. <laughs> I love them. These, these are the type of oil that I like. I feel like there is a bit more control with this. It's still, you are getting colors everywhere. You're still dealing with a lot of the same setup things, but you get to feel like you're drawing rather than dealing with the craziness of a brush. And you can get some really cool textures, I think, especially if you use the oil sticks on top of paintings that you have going. And there's an intensity to oil bars that's so luscious. I think about them as oil pastels, but maybe there's like a nuclear reaction <laughs> to the oil pastels and they go, bleh, they become very, very strong and intense. Yeah. They are expensive though. So it's not really that accessible for a lot of people, but if you can give it a shot, they're so much fun. Yeah, you can build up your collection over time. <laughs> <laughs> now, water mixable oils. This is a fairly recent development, and I just started trying them out. You can watch some of these paint alongs that we've done here at Art Prof, and this is the first one I did. So, if you want to see my bona fide first time reaction, <laughs> you can get it live on some of these videos. But I know for a lot of people, 
they say, oh, well, okay, I'll do these because I don't have to worry about the toxicity and everything. But honestly, I don't really feel like it's oil paint. I feel like it's just another paint. Have you ever used these, Lauren? I have never used them at all. They always seemed like pseudo oils to me. <laughs> but I say that having never used them, I know that they're extremely popular and that there is a reason so many people use them. They are, they do seem to be a lot easier to manage than regular oil paint. So I'd say that is something that works for you that makes that painting more accessible to you. Use them, do it. I mean, I was painting at my desk <laughs> with my laptop two inches away, which I would never do with oil paint. So there's that. But what I was getting a lot of questions on was, oh, how does this compare to oils? I just feel like if I think about them that way, I just am disappointed. It's just not, it's not the same thing. I just have to think about it as a completely different beast Wait, because so otherwise I'm just frustrated. What is, what is it the handling in it? It just doesn't handle the way that you expect it to? It's the feel in my brush. It all comes down to the feel. It's a very physical thing. They're just a little bit too slippery. Like they don't have the, the density and baggage of oil painting. <laughs> See, I don't know how much of this is psychological and how much of this is, oh, it's actually feels a lot different. I think that there's a psychological component to it. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Neil is asking, is it wrong that I use water mixable oils like watercolors? No, use them however you want. Who cares? <laughs> That's what I think. <laughs> okay, let's talk about gouache. And we are not Alex Rowe, so sorry, you're not getting the resident gouache expert. But I do sometimes think it's good to hear from somebody who's not very good at it. <laughs> like myself. <laughs> How would you describe gouache, Lauren? Gouache is like some weird cross between acrylic and watercolor that has an opacity to it, like acrylic, but moves on your paper like watercolor. It's, it comes out, in my opinion, I've only ever used gouaches that feel a little bit chalky, which I don't like so much. Uh, that sensation makes me feel weird, but I do like the look of gouache and how smooth it looks. I mean, I think gouache, it's a fairly thin paint. It's not like acrylic and oil where you can really build up like impasto and make it very sculptural looking. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why gouache and I don't get along. It's just, it feels so floppy to me because I'm used to that like body of oil. And so I think what we're trying to say is that none of these paints are better. It's just what is the best fit for what type of artist you are. Definitely. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't actually mind that, that floppiness. I like that you can get very sharp lines. That that's what I love about gouache. You can get such clean edges, <laughs> which I'm obsessed with for patterns, but that might not be for everyone. See, I hate flat edges. Like, they just drive me up the wall. <laughs> like that is no. not my cup of tea as an artist. <laughs> it's I I'm practically addicted to it. <laughs> Tom G says, canvas board, wood paper, so many mediums, and each brings up questions. How tight should the canvas be? Just so we're not. How many? Blah, 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 blah. I know. It's so many things to cover. And that's why you're finding that Lauren and I, even the two of us combined, we can only speak to a small percentage of the content that we're producing today because there's just so much to think about with painting. Yeah, it's it's good to think of painting. I think oftentimes we think of painting as a block. Oh, well, we're all painters. But I think it's really interesting inside of that how specialized we get. I've mostly only done acrylic. Even when I was doing body painting, I've done acrylic or oil. A lot of these things I wish I've tried. I know I've tried a tempera or some airbrush, but some of these I just have no idea, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I love the way Jill puts this. Gouache has a great smush. <laughs> yes, yes, that is exactly the word. That is terrific. And Desiree says, I'm just starting to get into gouache. I have found I like the matte opacity of it, but I have to get used to using a lot of water. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah. Speaking of water, <laughs> let's talk about watercolor. Watercolor and I, we we did not get off on the right start. We met in high school and I made all these assumptions about who I thought they were, which were all wrong, of course, but they didn't try very hard. And then, you know, I found them on Facebook 20 years later and said, come on, let's go hang out in Utah. <laughs> and then we became friends. I don't know. Watercolor is so hard. Yeah. Watercolor is that medium that you can't fight with it. When you fight with it, you will always lose. You have to let it do its thing and you have to roll with that. And once you are okay with letting go, there's, I guess there's a kind of Zen aspect to that. Uh, then it becomes usable or it becomes better. You can get more of the results that you want or you can work with the results that you get more likely. Well, and watercolor, Lauren, is where I realize that I shouldn't try to impose myself onto a paint. I shouldn't say, watercolor, you're just not as good as acrylic. Why can't you be like yeah. acrylic? And then I try to use it like acrylic and it just goes to crap. Right. And so for me, a big part of it was like learning to accept, okay, th this is the true nature of watercolor. I have to let it be who it truly is. The other thing about watercolor that I think is important or was important for me when I started working in more watercolor type areas is to get the right kind of paper and to treat the surface the correct way. Because the one thing that really bothered me was the way that the paper would warp and shrink and bend when I added the water to it. This even happens with markers, honestly, because you're still using a wet medium often. So I had to really learn how to <laughs> use my arches paper, how to get it wet and tape the edges and do all of that. And I really think I learned a lot about water itself in this process, less about the pigments and more just how water works and how it gets absorbed. Yeah, watercolor, as some people are saying in the chat, FDSFD says, I love how unforgiving watercolor is. It really makes me think about the happy accident. Hannah says, watercolor is frustrating to me. It's not a medium for artists who need control. And Alice says, watercolor and I are not on speaking terms. <laughs> Ouch. I mean, I, I made up with watercolor. We're, we're cool now. We, we figured each other out. It just took 20 years. <laughs> I, I think it's... Uh... I think it's something that you start with and you hate and then you come back to and you enjoy it. It requires a certain amount of patience to let it be its thing. Absolutely. It's, it's like parents who want to tell their artist kids to go be accountants. It's like, no, that is not going to go well in the end. <laughs> Kate says, watercolor is the classy, expressive childhood friend that is a little annoying but you have to let them be themselves. Exactly. They, they have a very strong inner personality. And you know what happened, Lauren? Oh, this is so, this is not a very nice story, but <laughs> my, my daughter who's in middle school, she had a watercolor project that she had to do for her art class. And the teacher made an example of watercolor and she showed it to me and she said, he's really trying to use watercolor as if it's acrylic and he's really not taking advantage of the best qualities of watercolor. And she showed me her watercolor painting of her best friend's bird. She totally let the watercolor be who it was. I was like, dude, I could not have done that in high school. It was really amazing. I mean, I am her mom, but... No, clearly your children are your children. I'm more amazed at that critique, that very articulate critique that your daughter gave of the teacher's work. <laughs> well, I mean, she, she does have a lot to compare all her teachers to. <laughs> okay, fresco, which I have never done before. And if you read anything about what goes into making a fresco, you're going to just cry on Michelangelo's behalf. It's a complicated process. I don't know a lot about it, but I think you have to paint it while it's still wet. Isn't which... it, is it more or less plaster painting? Yeah. Plaster? Okay. Basically. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, I, I have never used this process, but it seems like it is good for architecture. For it is, and that's typically 
where you will see frescoes is as a gigantic wall <laughs> in the Vatican museums. And they were really into fresco in the Renaissance and Baroque periods. Like, this is so terrible. But when I was going around Europe, you just see so many church ceilings that look like this, that after a while, you're just like, oh, okay, yeah, another Baroque fresco ceiling. <laughs> that was the style. That was the style then. The Last Supper is a fresco. And honestly, when I saw it in person, it's in really bad shape. Have you ever seen it, Lauren? I haven't seen it in person. I was going to ask about the durability of fresco. Do you have an idea of how easy or hard that is to preserve over that many years? They're all oh, wild. I have no idea. Yeah. Well, W three one five says the true fresco is colored wet plaster on top of more plaster, and you have to plan out what you do in one session. Ugh. Yikes. I don't want to do that. <laughs> but I do really love this fresco, which is in Kyoto, Japan, because so many of us do associate it with the Italian Renaissance and the Romans. And this is such a different take on the material, isn't it? Yeah, I think that it's really gorgeous. A lot of the frescoes that I am aware of are those Italian ones, as you've talked about. And this just has a totally different feel to it and also a very limited palette, which I enjoy. It's very based on these tonal shifts. All right, let's talk about outdoor paints. And I just clumped this together because so many artists who work on site outdoors, they use everything. And there's even Swoon, who is a street artist, and she purposefully makes outdoor installations in non-permanent paint so that they disintegrate on purpose. So it's like anything goes for outdoor painting, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, outdoor, outdoor stuff's really interesting. It depends on what you want to do with it. As you said, I know that a lot of artists that are working with the outside really take into account that disintegration over time. That is also a part of the work and a part of the, the place being in the space. Yeah, so it's great to look at these gigantic murals. Sometimes they're on the side of a building. I mean, this artist, Odili Donald Odita, yeah, also Odili's worked really on, cool. yeah, on these huge canvases, but he also has done outdoor work as well. So oftentimes you'll have people who are maybe trained in painting on canvas, but who also have done large scale murals. And so it's, it's a really wonderful way to stretch your comfort zone as an artist. Yeah, I think the... That, that was one thing that I was thinking about in this whole thing that we put together is how, how much scale is a part of painting itself. Oftentimes, if you're just getting into painting, usually you're thinking about working on your 9 by 12 surface or whatever. But this is really a way to engage in the architecture of a space, which is a whole different thing, trying to justify illusionary space or illusionistic space with real physical space. So Shell Ray says, what's the difference between fresco and murals? Well, so fresco is the particular paint medium which involves plaster. A mural could be made out of fresco, but it can be made out of anything. I mean, you could take enamel okay. paint or lacquer or whatever and paint a brick wall and that would be a mural. So a mural is more just saying it's a huge painting. Usually it's on site. And fresco is more the actual paint material that's being yeah. used. All right. How about egg tempera, Lauren? They could not get enough of this in the Renaissance. <laughs> they could not get enough of this at my materials and techniques classes. When did you do that? In grad school? I, I, I did that in high school in, at RISD and at Purchase. I have used egg tempera three times. I've never used it. Okay, this is your domain. <laughs> I mean, even after using it, I don't know that much about it, but you are mixing eggs. I believe it is the yolk of the egg with your pigment. And it's really fun to do, but you got to be careful about storage because if you leave your paints out or you don't use them fast enough, they smell really horrendous. Really, 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 really bad. The cool thing about egg tempera, though, 
uh, as Seven Angelic is saying, what the longevity of egg tempera, it lasts forever. This paint is super durable. It's it's up there with oil paint. I think it surpasses oil paint and durability. Have you guys ever tried to get a yolk, a hardened yolk off of your plate? Because oh my god, that, it takes it turns into lacquer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It takes think of that drying for a hundred years and then trying to scrub it off. You're never going to get it off. <laughs> I never thought about it that way. That actually makes a lot of sense now. <laughs> but oh, <laughs> the other cool thing about egg tempera is that. You're supposed to build it up in a bajillion, bajillion, bajillion thin layers. You're not supposed to do it in one layer. I only had the patience for about 10 layers in my painting, so it wasn't that good. But the best egg temper paintings, they're done on panel, and they have about a thousand layer layers, kind of like your Photoshop digital painting. <laughs> All right, let's talk about airbrush. And if we want to talk about hierarchy i feel very bad for airbrush i'm sorry it just it really gets so little respect i think people associate it with bad fan art jean jacket drawings it just has such a bad reputation I don't, and it's sort of a bummer i don't agree with you well maybe in the long run i agree with you but I put an airbrush here because airbrush is so hot right now. I'm in New York City and I feel like every other contemporary art show has some airbrush painter in it. My roommate paints with airbrush, has a very loud machine that goes <laughs> and <you laughs> spray it on. And the cool thing about airbrush, I think one of the reasons why it's gotten really big is that these soft edges that you can get with it create these drop shadow effects that are kind of reminiscent of some MS Paint type effects or digital effects that are part of this 90s, 2000s nostalgia, <laughs> as well as this kitsch kind of thing where, where, oh yeah, it does look like fan art a little bit. That kind of thing is popular right now. Well, I think Lisa H is summing it up that people do have this association with airbrush. It's like a car painting of biker chicks. And you know what's funny? I didn't know that this artist, Philip Castle, in addition to Giger, he's very, very well known as an airbrush artist. But I didn't know that he did the full metal jacket cover and he also did Clockwork Orange. I, I, I had no remember. idea that this was an airbrush painting. Did you? Nope. But I, I could see it. You can get very detailed with it. So the way airbrush works is you have, I don't know what type of paint it is. I think it is a water-based paint. And you have a little nozzle and an air compressor thing. And you press a button, a little gun, and you can spray it. It's kind of almost like doing spray paint, except in, I believe it's less smelly. Yes, John you should hear is asking. Yes, yeah. you should. Is it toxic? I mean, it's got pigments in it, and you don't want to breathe those in. That's bad. Never breathe in aerosolized paint, ever. That's so bad for you. Okay, now, there, there's got to be a debate here <laughs> about whether ink counts as paint. People have different opinions. I just thought we'd put it in here because I love ink, and why not have an opportunity to talk about ink and what it can do? And we know that Alex is our resident ink wash artist I try to keep up, but I love ink wash because I was just so tired of charcoal, Lauren, after my first year of art school and my first sophomore drawing class, the teacher was like, oh, we're gonna do ink. And I was like, yes, <laughs> thank you. I was so happy. And that's when I discovered ink wash and it's one of my favorite sketching media now. Yeah, I really love ink wash. I think it's beautiful. And I do consider it a paint because I think with ink, you are using it in, in blocks or you're thinking like a painter where you're thinking about the shapes of color or of tone in this case that you're putting down. And that is very different from drawing and using ink for drawing where you're thinking about edges. You're not thinking about those shapes as much. Yeah, so tell us in the chat, do you consider ink to be paint? Jill is saying ink is a more deliberate watercolor. Ariel says, I think ink wash is paint. Anna says, I personally hate it on its own, but I think combining it with other media can be cool. I mean, 
I use it more for sketching. So some part of me thinks that it's more how do you use it? Because mm -hmm. the way that, say, Marlena Dumas uses it, to me, is very painterly. But the way I use it, it's not really about painting. Yeah, definitely. I feel that same way about markers, too, Clara, where they could be a drawing material, but they're also definitely a painting material, depends how you want to see it. Kessem says, what's the difference between ink and watercolor? I feel like they kind of work the same. Not quite, because at least the India ink that I use, it's liquid. Whereas watercolor, you have to take water to activate the paint, whether you use it out of a tube or a cake. And so I just find that India ink out of a, out of a bottle, it's just really intense and yeah. powerful. The one thing that interests me with India ink that's different from watercolor is that because it is actually the liquid, sometimes you'll get a case where the ink has become a little bit dehydrated and gets super dense and sits on top of the page and gets like almost these blobs. It has a totally different movement than well hydrated ink. And you can use those in different ways, which is really fun. All right, let's talk about enamel paint, which I know nothing about. So this is up to you, Lauren. <laughs> okay, so I haven't used enamel either, but I think that it is really interesting as a paint. Basically, it is a, it or the things that make it itself is that it dries in a super, super, super hard, brittle, shiny coat. It has a very glossy color to it. I think it's technically lacquer. And so kind of like how we were talking about flash paint, this is really a thing of surfaces. What kind of surface and what kind of luminosity do you like with your paint? Because it's totally going to change the character of what you're doing. I also think that lacquer tends to be very, or not lacquer, enamel tends to be pretty opaque too. I mean, think of uh, nail polishes, for instance, that is kind of in the same realm. So we have a couple of technical question. FDS says, do you use watercolor paper for ink wash? I usually do. I'm pretty picky about paper when it comes to wet media because like watercolor, it does really affect your results, especially if you want to get a more textured result. And Neil is asking, isn't this the paint used to paint furniture? Is it? Yeah, you can use it to paint furniture. It's, it's considered an outdoor paint because of that super hard durability of it. It, it comes in many forms, I should say. Like, I, I think the outdoor paint is the most, the one that we see the most often. Phoebe P says, I've seen enamel paint in jewelry. Is this the same thing? This is important. In ceramics, I know enamel is not, enamel used in that, and probably I'm assuming jewelry as well, is not the same thing. It's a different way of applying it and a different way of drying or oxidizing it. And we have another question here from Kui Kui who says, fountain pen ink versus India ink, are they different? They're very different. I have used fountain pen ink and it's just not remotely as intense. I mean, the India ink, it's like a nuclear blast of paint, which is oh, so awesome. I love it. <laughs> okay. Oh, one more enamel question. Maria says, what would you use enamel paint on? Like, do you do canvas lorn or glass? What do you use? Oh, man. I would use it on, I believe, wood or metal, things that are more definitely not canvas. It's going to dry in a way that's very brittle. And so anything that's flexible, it's just going to like pop off, you know? So you want something that's hard underneath it. Those Gary Hume images that we were just looking at, those were painted on aluminum. So metal is definitely an option. Yeah. Okay. And caustic. I have always wanted to try encaustic, but I've never had the opportunity. And you know why I really want to do it? Because I love wax. Wax is like, oh, yeah, wax is amazing. It's sculptural and it's like, I don't know. I, it's just such an amazing material. And I've used wax for sculpture before. And the idea of using it with paint is amazing. So how do you describe what encaustic is, Lauren? Oh man, I haven't done encaustic in forever, but basically you're heating up these little tubs of beeswax. You get it really hot so that it becomes very liquidy 
and then you're applying a little bit of pigment. I think oils are often used with encaustic. So you use some of that pigment and then the, the, the wax is basically your, your, your binder thing that's giving it motility. And you, you are using that with a paintbrush and applying that to canvas. And what's really great about wax is one, the layering is gorgeous. It has these transparent layers that are great, but my favorite part is the textures that you can build up really, really, really fast. And it is just super luxurious. There is this kind of transparency opacity that you can't get with any other medium. And yeah. Jazz W is asking, what's the difference between hot wax and cold wax? Well, cold wax medium in the oil painting context is sort of like white clear butter. <laughs> like you can just pick it up, you can mix it in with your paint so that way your paint just gets a lot of body. It's very substantial, you can build it up and it has a beautiful translucent quality. Now hot wax is like a candle where you have to melt it and then it sets. Cold wax, to my knowledge, doesn't dry that quickly. I think it has to sit there for a long time. I think this comment's really important from W315Bird. You need good ventilation for encaustic because hot wax fumes are very bad. This is something I definitely remember from when I first used it in my little after school art class when I was 16, as we had to have the garage doors up and everything. It was a big deal because those wax fumes are no good for your body. All right. Let's talk about Casey and the one paint that neither Lauren and I know. Oh my God, I can't about. believe you put this one in, Clara. <laughs> I try to be comprehensive, and a lot of that involves talking about things I don't know anything about. <laughs> so, anybody in the chat, do you know what casein is and have you used it? We're really looking for some <laughs> contemporary casein painters. Help us. <laughs> <laughs> We're probably the only people giving art history lectures telling everybody that they need to inform us. <laughs> we should have called, nicknamed Casey, Casey Runin. I like that, Neil. That's really good. That was cute. <laughs> yeah, Hannah says, Casey makes me think of James Gurney. So we were <laughs> going to tell you guys, if you want to know about Casey, just head over to James Gurney's wonderful YouTube channel because he's gonna tell you way more about casein than Lauren and I ever can. <laughs> We're just telling you that casein exists. Oh, we haven't even said what casein is, have we, Clara? We have not, and Sophia, you are correct. Doesn't casein have something to do with milk? From what I got in my one minute Wikipedia search, <laughs> it told me that it's derived from a milk protein. Yes, I don't know if that means actually mixing milk into your paint or not. I feel very dumb about this. I don't know how you derive casein. Well, this is a much better explanation. Desiree says it's a milk protein paint. The only artist I can think of is James Gurney. And Jill explains casein dries harder than gouache, but it's still rewettable. And Maria says it's kind of like a permanent gouache of some sorts. All right. Well, you Thank guys you. can go learn more. <laughs> okay. This is a huge category. And we're just going to briefly mention that painting is oftentimes blended with mixed media. And you'll see a lot of painters like Anselm Kiefer, who's a contemporary artist, really work in textures and, and pretty much anything into their paint. Yeah, you can make little fossils in your paint from totally outside things that have nothing to do with painting. I think that there's an artist, Michael David, that I've seen here in New York that does a lot of that embedding little objects within his paintings. Fab Geek says, I didn't realize there was a multitude of paint media, very informative. Yeah, again, this curriculum, it's about exposure. We're just trying to say this exists. Now go look it up and have some fun because that's the important thing is getting the exposure to all of these different types of paints. 
W315 says, soak old cheese in water equals casein. Great wood glue. Ew. <laughs> what kind of cheese? Does it matter? <laughs> I don't know. As somebody who's terrified of rotten, moldy things, this just really upsets me right now. <laughs> Everybody's been saying in the chat that we have got a full breakfast out of our paints now. We got the eggs and the milk and the cheese, all the dairy. Yeah, you got, you guys don't need to make a meal out of this. This is a question for you, Lauren, which is Jazz saying, what about alcohol inks? So the only way that I have used alcohol inks is in markers, which kind of, for me at least, are in this weird gray category between drawing and painting, but in, I think, most uses, they get used more in, in drawing with markers. But if you've used alcohol inks not as markers, as actual, or as actual paints, please let us know in the chat. This Google slideshow is available. The link is in the YouTube video description below. It's also linked on the art resources page on our main site, artprof.org. Artprof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And in a few minutes, Lauren and I will be hanging out in the Artprof Discord. We will be in the post live streams channel so we can talk to you about glitter ink, Yupo paper, yes, the Cleveland Yupo. of Art, and markers or whatever else <laughs> that you guys Anything. want to chat about. <laughs> Subscribe to our channel so you can continue to grow and develop as an artist. And a big thank you to our top Patreon supporters. Your support is what keeps ArtProf up and running. We are so grateful to have all of you here contributing to the discussion, sharing about ArtProf, telling us what casein is <laughs> since we don't know. <laughs> everybody thank you so much for watching we'll see you next time bye, bye.